Well, we looks like the Lesham. Mm -hmm. This is not, yeah. Looks yeah. like the Lesham. This is actually an art school. We're going to um, do the, the art. We're doing the Haggadah or something, right? We're doing Haggadah. We're doing Pesach, Haggadah, summing the whole thing up, the, pur the purpose of life, you name it. Okay? All, <laughs> all, in, all in one hour or less. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cra crash course on the meaning of life. Yeah. Okay. It's like the Rambam. The Rambam, you know, he said basically he was writing the Mishnah Torah to bring an end to the need for any more Svari. Because, because people were in, you know, those days it was very hard to get it. It was scroll. It was written by hand, and there wasn't printing press at that point in time. And uh, Klai was in the disa disaster. It was in the diaspora, which is a disaster. And, uh, you know, they had to know the Paskin Halacha, and not everybody even had Gemaras in those days. Very, very rare, let alone have access to them. And, um, and he had to make it that people could function. So he said, this safer will, will Paskin and end the need for the Sfarim, and uh, as people, as as as, as Achronim have pointed out, or even Roshonim, that no Sefer has spawned more Sfarim than the Mishnah Torah, in the end. It's almost like these are fighting words, you know, it's like, you know, you want to say anything like that? Like, you know, pen your bed, can your bed, you know, you know, you know that they, you know, in case they, uh, you know, in case they will, you know, multiply, Dafka, Kosh Made that the Jews in the Sfarim would multiply. So it's like you know, you want to end all Sfarim. The Jewish people are the people of the book. You can't end the Sfarim, but you want to help them out. Fantastic. But the Sefer basically has you know because of the the depth and and the precision of the Mishnah Torah basically has spawned a tremendous amount of commentaries. Probably the only thing rivaling that is the Haggadah. You know, Pesach is so central to the Jewish people. The Haggadah. You just you just walk into a bookstore and see each year how many new Haggadahs come out. And some of them are old Haggadahs that we republished, that never were out available in the, the past, or some were collected, or, you know, they're a, a, a likut of different, you know, different you know, points that were brought up by a certain Mephorish in different Sfarim. They put it together one safer and attached it to the proper places in Haggadah, but is a, you know, a plethora, right, of, of, of material on Haggadah itself, each thing being explained, uh, and I used to have a minhag, basically, of, of every year taking a new Haggadah and reading it 30 days before Pesach, and you know, getting a different different take on, on, on different mitzvahs of, of the Haggadah itself. And it's a great minute to have, actually. Unfortunately, I sort of fell out of it, but uh, especially when I started writing my own material based upon things I'd seen over, over the years. But, uh, you know, it's just endless, absolutely endless. Ein sof kimat. And it, it makes sense because after, this is the birth day of the Jewish people, so to speak, and as much as we were, you know, were freed, and everything that we're supposed to be is wrapped up, you know, is wrapped up in the whole concept of the Haggadah. Yet it's an amazing thing, as much as that's the case, how much we don't really focus on what's really supposed to happen, what's really going on. Right? It's almost like we're focusing, you know, the focus on the details, uh, you know, the small picture, meaning that everything that is the Haggadah is broken up into different sections. So every section is explained vis-a-vis -vis itself, you know, and not so much the big picture. What's supposed to, you know, so if you had to like accumulate all the information and synthesize it and put it into like a sikrum, a very short paragraph of what we are trying to achieve. What is the essence of Cheris? Because here we are 3,320 some odd years later, we're still making a save there, we're still in Galus, we haven't solved the puzzle. We haven't, you know, rectified the problem and, you know, you know changed the situation. If anything, we've gone further away. Amazingly, you know, so many Jews still make, you know, they all say it, even though a lot of times it's just, it's just a family family uh, meal, but nonetheless, the Seder is the reason for everyone to get together. There's some kind of connection. People do somewhat of the Seder, whether they believe it or not. That's another also amazing thing is how we sit down every year to make the Seder and celebrate an event that most of the world thinks is fictitious. They don't believe in it, including many Jews today. You know, but they read the Haggadah anyhow, they go through it. So, you know, we haven't really got very far uh, in terms of trying to, to, to solve the riddle, solve the mystery, because and one of the problems, as we saw before, was because people think that the Haggadah, you know, the Seder is basically a straight celebration. And as the Leshen pointed out, the very fact that we eat matzah on the Seder, not because there was, wasn't enough time to bake bread, but as we said before, that the Kosh Baruch Hu made it that there wasn't enough time to bake bread, so we'd make sure that we'd have chat, you know, matzah. Avram Avinu, as the Brisket Rebbe points out, ate matzah, leil Seder. The 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 machlokis in the medrash that that existed between Kain and Hevel was over at Korban Pesach. That was the sacrifice that they were supposed to have, you know, be bringing at that point in time. So Adam knew he had some kind of masorah. He had a chush that Leil Seder, the fifteenth of Nisan, 
is a it's a very uh, it's a very chashuv time of year for for chedus, and uh, so obviously these are these things are built into the bria, and the chagim are like windows, you know, like or doors. You you're walking around a, a dark room trying to get out. There's no electricity, there's no chashmal. You can't see where the door is, and you just feel your, you feel your way around, right? Eventually, you get to a, you know, an opening in the wall. There's no there's no wall there. You assume that's, that's an opening, you know, and you walk down that opening until you get the light. Likewise, all year round, we're all we're always trying to get to cheres. We we'd like it always to be zman cheres center, but we can't. There's just not the opportunity. Just like Yom Kippur is a time for tshuva, Shema is a time for tshuva, tshuva and kippura. It's a very opportune time, as the Rambam points out. If you don't do it then, chances are you won't do it the rest of the year because the amount of siyat shema you need to be able to successfully do tshuva and kippura is, is great, and you don't have that kind of siyat shema the rest of the year. You have it specifically during the thirty days of Elul, and then through the seresim tshuva. The ten days of repentance, that's what Kush Baruch Hu makes it literally in a, in a, a Elul as an, an Anila Dodi Vidodi Li. Kush Baruch Hu goes out of his way, Kiviyocho, to make it that we should be able to do Tshuva if we want to. So it's a very propitious time. Likewise, when it comes to Cherus, freedom, so we, are, we want to be free people all year round. But this is the time that Kush Baruch Hu makes, the, makes it, it possible, makes it easy to be able to achieve it. But you can't, you can't do it if you're not going to be, uh, you know, aware of what the window actually is, what the opportunity actually is, and as a result of that, Leil Seder, the Haggadah, basically becomes um, just an event, it just becomes in a celebration, a thing to do, get together, fulfill it. Also, the emphasis on the halacha is to make sure you're doing exactly what's supposed to be done, to be the mitzvah of Arbukosos and and Chilis Matzah, you know, and all the machlokas that exist around that. Right exactly, you know, all these different things, you know, and it's like, you get distracted away from the main event, and the, and the amazing thing that people don't realize is that that's Amalek too. That's Amalek too. Amalek will do whatever he can to keep us from going free. That's clear. His number one device is distraction. And he doesn't care whether it's a from distraction, if it's a secular distraction, doesn't make it, whatever gets you, whatever, you know, gets your attention, pulls you away, you know, as we said, the Gemara, the Gemara brings down by David the Melech, right? The Melech Hamavis was supposed to take his life at the age of 70. His time was up. But as long as he was learning Torah, he couldn't take it. He couldn't, he couldn't get his Neshama because he was also big Torah. There's a Shmira. Melech Hamavis had no Shlit over him. So what did he do instead? He basically made a distraction by making the trees, the, the leaves rustle in the tree. And that caught David the Melech's attention. And he went to check it out. And he climbed the ladder. As he climbed the ladder, he was frail. So he fell down and, and died, right? But it's a distraction. Distractions are what kill us. And I think today we could, with confidence, say this is the most distracting society mankind has ever known, except for wars. Obviously, war, wars. Obviously, wars are more distracting. You have, you know, living in bunkers and, you know, and having to worry about missiles falling, a lack of food. That's a very distracting. But in terms of peacetime, this is the most uh, probably distracting society mankind has ever had to, had to deal with. I mean, just. There's been, there's been never, you know, during, during wars, obviously, when you're doubling in a minion, you know, you're always afraid that a missile might come and the sirens go off and that's going to distract you for sure. But during peacetime, we've never had such distractions like cell phones going off in Shemana Esrei, you know, and, and they go by, somehow, they, don't, they know exactly when they go off, just as the Chaz is doing Kedusha, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, <laughs> well, you know they, it, and it's distracting, you can lose your, you know, your focus, just like that, and changes the whole world, changes the whole world. Person to be ready to make a bracha, you know, again Avraham, right? And you have to be mechapim for that bracha for the whole Shemana Esri, right? And this, this, happened, this happened to me, you know, the cell phone goes off and you know it catches your attention and the words come out anyhow because it, it's automatic. And I just said, I just said Magan Avraham and I was focused on his cell phone, right? And, it, and all of a sudden, you have a halachic issue just like that. Do I go back to the beginning? Do I you know, start all over again? Do I have to continue? That's Amalek, right? So Amalek knows what, what gets to us. You can also use halacha too to distract us because if the, the goal is to learn the halacha, then obviously he's not going to distract you with halacha. He's going to distract you with somebody knocking at the front door, the phone going off, or getting hungry, whatever the case may be. If the issue is something else, for example, cherus by the seder, so then he can use halacha. And he can use you know, the, you know, the exactitude of, of doing things exactly right or trying to strip as many deep Torah as you can at the same to make it meaningful, you know, at the same time losing sight of the big picture. So what is the big picture? You gotta sum it up, what is the big picture of Leo Seder? So there's a Pasik, right, that we say every single day is part of part of Pesukah Zimre, and it comes from let's just see, it comes from twelve, right? Thank you, where's my art scroll? It comes from uh, where did it come from? Tehillim, it's all from Tehillim, okay? 
The pasuk is the following way. It says, "Anoichi Hashem lo kecha, hamalacha meeres mitzrayim, archet picha v'molehu." Right? Because Baruch Hu tells you this pasuk that we say every single day in Tehillim exactly what it, what he was doing and why he did it. I am God, your God. Right? Anoichi Hashem lo kecha, hamalacha. Right? Hamalacha. Ha Hamalacha. Yeah. Hamalacha. Mi Eretz Mitzrayim. Right? Harchev Picha. Expand your mouth. Right? You should expand your mouth. Right? The Malayhu. And I will fill it. I fill them in the end. Right? So this Pasik has everything. I love this Psuki. It's like this. This is right. It's right before me. Right before me. No. Every day. Right before me. Soda. The last is like it's like the second or third last Pasik. Before Mizm Mizm of the soda. This is Sfardi. So this is before Mizm of the soda. But in, in Ashkenazi, it's before Mizm of the soda. Right? right there. Okay? So, you know, on this Pasuk alone, you can ask me a question because uh, it's an, it, 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 Anoich itself, the fact that Lashon Anoich is, is already to call up a discussion about the, the Chof, right? Ani Chof, right? I am, you know, I am that which basically uh, is the Hester Panim, I'm the Gilud Panim, and I'm the Hester Panim. That's a share from back at the time of. Uh, Pouring back then, right? Hashem Elokecha, the Lord your God, Hamalach Emeris Yisraim. Now it's interesting because everywhere else it talks about taking leaving Yisraim, it never uses a lashon from Alacha. Always says, you know, Hashem says, "Eschem Emeris Yisraim, who took you out? I took you out of Mitzrayim." But here it says, "I elevated you from Eretz Mitzrayim. I didn't just take you out. I elevated you. I brought you up from there." So obviously, in a, on a, in a shot level, you know, it's the same thing because every time you leave any place to go to Eretz Yisrael, you're always it's why it's called Aliyah. You're going up. But nonetheless, if you're Madaik and the Lashem, you have to ask the question why he says over here specifically, I elevated, I took you up from Meretz Yisrael, right? And then it says, right, that Harche uh, Picha, expand your mouth from Malehu, right? So what is the question Baruch Hu saying? I took you out of Mitzrayim to feed you, right? Open wide so I can now give you what you have something to eat. And then what, what does this Pasuk mean? Obviously, he's talking on a more spiritual level, right? Especially when it comes to Pesach, and we said before, we began last week, that Pesach is all about the mouth. It's all about speech. It's all about speaking. The halacha is you can be sitting at the you know the center table all by yourself, all by your lonesome. Nobody else is with you for some reason. It should never happen to a person like that. But for, this guy's traveling, got stuck somewhere, had to make a seder, right? He has got the haggadah. He's a tamuchachem. He knows the haggadah backwards and forwards. He knows the perushim in the haggadah. There's no one to talk to but Hashem himself, and Hashem certainly knows the haggadah already, right? What's the halacha? Can he simply read it to himself quietly or not even at all? Obviously, he'll do it, but you know, quietly. No, he must speak out the, the Haggadah. He must say the words themselves, right? You have a mitzvah, a sipu is his right. A mitzvah to recount the going out of Egypt, right? To, to the extent that it says that, you know, if you, the more you do it, you know, the more mishubach you are, the more praiseworthy you are. Why such an emphasis on the speaking? There's so many, other, so many mitzvahs, so many halakhim, so many different you know, details of, of the Seder. Right? Why is the seaport itself, why is the telling of the story so important? We, okay, there's no question, recounting, it's all, all part of a chorus of tov, being grateful for the good that Hashem did for us, that's also part of uh, you know, the, whole, the whole thing. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's really what it's supposed to be about. But if you go deeper into the story, right, then you see, you know, and even before that, you go back to the, you know, the whole, whole concept of covenant, you know, the, Another remarkable thing, how you get used to things, and because you get used to things, you begin to take things for granted. But the covenant that basically sealed the relationship between Avraham and Hashem, and therefore between Avraham's descendants, and the Kosh for all history, is bris mila. Which, of course, you ask anybody, what does bris mila mean? They will tell you it means circumcision, which is, of course, that's what it is, right? Bris mila, circumcision. But, you know, what's mila? Mila is like the circumcision, doing mila. By doing, you know, by by circumcising the child, pre is re removing the you know the foreskin, but mila is making the cut. Right, that's mila, right? No, but what does it really mean? What do you mean? What does it really mean? What does the word mila mean? Oh, it means covenant of the word. The word mila is a word. So the actual covenant that the Kodesh Baruch Hu made with Abraham is actually what the Gemara calls bris krus svasayim, a bris, a covenant that was sealed with the lips. So the Gemara says, what does that mean? It means basically that you know, part of being the Jewish people is that you should mean what you say. Your, your mouth should be consistent with your heart. Your, your lips should not utter things that are not truth. You know, if you have to lie for halachic reasons, that's also part of truth, right? The lie to protect yourself, the lie is dumb, 
because it's an easy way out. That's not that's that goes against the bris truce of society. So the, the actual you know you know you know the the bris that was the you know was cut with the lips in the end. But it goes you know even back further, right? It goes back even further because it should be the most obvious thing that Pesach is about speech. It's all about freeing the Jewish mouth. It's it's all about freeing the Jewish mouth. And why should it be about freeing the Jewish mouth? Because you go back to 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 Parshish Bereshis, Pashut, simple point. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't pay much attention to, but it's such an important Hashu point. What's that? So Kush Baruch Hu makes Adam Arishon. One hour he take, forms the limbs, then he shapes them. You know, you know, the whole process of day six. So finally, he gets to the point where he's going to he's going to breathe a soul, a living, a, a, a nefesh chaya into the first man. He's going to give him life, take him out of the golem state. And put him into the into the human state, the the you know Elohim state. By putting a nefesh chai, a living soul in him. So what is the what is the, the most important difference between not having the nefesh chai and getting the actual nefesh chai? That we have thumbs. <laughs> He's like you know thumbs like you know. so. Uncle says right there, you get what's called ruach mamalala, the, the 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 spirit of speaking. You become a speaking spirit at that point in time. Speech is that which defines a person. And the Zohar actually says that. The Zohar says that you can tell who a person is by what he says. Because the juncture point between the soul and the body is speech. Mm-hmm. Not action, because animals also perform action. You know, they bring, you know, there's, there's a halakha, there's a mitzvah of dalna chaschus, right? We have a mitzvah of dalna chaschus, means that if you see someone do something that might be questionable, you judge, you know, and they're basically an honorable person, you should judge on the side of merit. To such an extent that Gemara says if you don't judge on the side of merit, then you can actually suffer, you know, consequences yourself for not doing it. Mukal the goof, the person gets can be actually physically, you know, you know, uh, injured by Shemani because he wasn't done the chaschus. It's a very important mitzvah. The Gemara brings down different cases. You know, Rabbi Kiva with, uh, with his future father, his father in law, I think it was, you know, so and and then another of another tana basically in all these situations where it was so easy the done chov, just the opposite. But they they judge the side of merit, and that's where we're supposed to go. Right, so so because actions are deceiving, you know. Hannah Teller wrote a book years ago about about judge the side of Mary. He brought all kinds of stories down, based upon true accounts. And one of the stories was about a gabai who was in the, the, the subway station, someplace I guess in New York, you know. And uh, someone, you know, Meshul saw him and he was about to, you know, to you know give him shalom aleichem, and he sees him run to a treif restaurant. Oh, the, the rabbi of the shul sees it. Actually, it was a rabbi of the shul who run to the treif restaurant. He looks, he can't, you know, maybe he's making a phone call or something like that. Right? He looks inside, he sees him sitting down at the table, right? Food coming, and he's actually eating this tray of food. The rabbi's, you know, beside himself, he can't, the rabbi had the shul eating tray of food. How's that possible? And he also, make a long story short, that uh, he, he just couldn't, you know, he heard shortly after he was in the hospital, and he just couldn't come to visit him because, you know, he knew the truth. You know, how, how, it, how could this person, you know, parade himself as a, you know, from Dati Jew? And he's the Gabbai the Shul, and he's eating tray food, right? So finally, the rabbi was able to force himself to come and to visit the you know, Gabbai. And before he could open his mouth, he said, he said you know, it's not good to see you. Or, you know, but you know, let me tell you how it was terrible. I was in the subway station and had an ulcer attack, basically. And I was told that you know, in such an attack like that, if you don't eat food immediately, it could be, it could be, it could be uh, you know, critical. And I had to run into this restaurant and eat this tray food, because if I didn't, be, I might have you know, you know, died in the process. And it was just terrible to eat this thing, you know, and the rabbi reels as he's sitting there listening to the story, how he totally misread the entire thing, because actions are deceiving, both for good and both for bad. Right? That's why by Shabbos, it's Malachas Meshavis. The whole idea of Malachas Meshavis is that there has to be thought, we have Kavana, right? Even, you know, even though we, we hope for the most part that Mitzvah, you know, in with Kavana, that only means that as much as, it, as, it, as if you, when you're doing the Mitzvah, you might, your mind might drift, so it's not a problem. The mitzvah is still being done. But if you don't have kavanah to do the mitzvah itself in the first place, there's no mitzvah. You take the groceries of some somebody across the road, some elderly lady who can, is looking for someone to help her out. She goes inside to find someone to take the bags for her. In the meantime, you think they're your bags. And you pick them up and take them across the road, realizing now they're the wrong bags. She comes running outside and says, Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Can I give you something? No, no, what, what? These are my bags. These are your bags in the end? Does he get a mitzvah? No. He thought they were his bags. Even though the actual, the actual mice was being done, exactly what had to be done, but he had no kavanah whatsoever. If he thought to himself, maybe I can help her. And in the meantime, as he's walking across the road, his mind, you know, since you're the stock market, ain't by you. Because the, the, the initial starting point was, I'm going to do this mitzvah. There's a mitzvah, I'm going to do it, right? 
But it, actions basically don't tell the story. The, but the Zohar says the moment a person opens his mouth, you know, how many times are you someplace public where you see people who like, look like, you know, dressed like, you know, you know, successful businessmen, the haircut, the glasses, the, the, the suit, everything, and they open their mouth and they talk in a way that's like, I cannot believe they're talking like this. You know, in such a crude fashion, immediately, no matter how they look on the outside, you don't buy it. You figure it's, it's a fraud. And yet, you can meet people who don't necessarily dress so fancy. And you get into a conversation with them, and they're intelligent, and they're sensitive, and they're polite, and the whole thing. And you walk with tremendous respect for them, even if they don't look, you know, so respect from the outside. You find, even find reasons why they might be dressed like that. And, you know, and, you know, because they, they have no money to buy clothing. So actions are deceiving. But the moment a person opens their mouth, it shows how much soul... How much, how much goof? And the Gemara says this. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Tzadi Tas Amud Beis. It's a remarkable Gemara. It's an amazing Gemara that ties like this Pasik, where it's so informational. It's like so critical and so crucial for any understanding what we're doing here in this world. And why Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim in the first place? And it says in the Gemara, I might have thought that a person is here to do Maisi, right? <laughs> Well, of course, look at the world, how physical this world is. People are doing mycelium all the time. The Gemara he brings a pasta from Eov, I think it's from Eov, that a person's mouth is an okif for him. It's, a, it's like his, his mouth is, his, you know, is like a, a saddle for him that he rides. So this, I learned, the Gemara says, that the world was made for speech. Man can exist for the sake of speech. Actions are, are secondary, right? And, and he says after that, he says, you know, the Gemara says that maybe it means any kind of speech. Right? Even Sichus Chul. So Gemara brings a Pasig that these words should not leave your mouth ever. Pasig from the Sefer Yeshua. From this we learn that a person was created specifically to speak a deep break Torah. That's what he's here for. That's the whole point. So now we can understand, go back to the story of Moshe Benu. What was the more? Tzadik Tet, where? Ahmed Bet, where? Ahmed Beis? Yeah. Tzadik Tet, Ahmed Beis, and so right, right at the top, right? So now we can go back and understand the story, right, of Moshe Ben. Moshe Ben is going down to Mitzrayim, okay? What is his time? God has appointed you. He's telling you, you must go down to Mitzrayim to save the Jewish people. What is his chief time, right? What's his main, his main complaint why he can't do it? Okay, maybe, you know, behind the scenes, he, he feels bad on behalf of Arna Cohen. That comes up later on, right? But what's his main time? He says, you know, I need oral sign. I have uncircumcised lips, and yeah, the whole story back in, when he was a child, you know, in Mitzrayim, where the where Parah had a his, his chartum, the chartum of the astrologer, they, they you know they told him that one day he's going to take the crown from him to so do the whole test with the, the cold and the, you know the diamond or whatever. But the bottom line is, was that he's worried about or he's, or so science. So Kodesh Baruch Hu says, who's the one who you know who forms the mouth, who puts the words in your mouth to be able to speak? Everything has been shemaim, the ears, the whole thing. What are you worried about? You know, for seven days he argues his entire point, but. In the midst of all this, one of the most bizarre parts of the entire story, which again, a very important, critical part that people don't pay enough attention to because it's important to keep the entire thing. He's going down to Mitzrayim, right? He's got a son to do bris milo on. On the way down, he gets to the parking lot of the Holiday Inn, right? He figures he should check in first because, you know, to do it in the parking lot over here, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, it's not appropriate. It's just a few minutes longer. Believe me, you can assume that Moshe Benu. He has nothing else on his mind but doing this brisk meal in his son the first chance he can get. Traveling, dangerous, okay? He waits a little bit too long, and the Kush Baruch sends a nachash. A nachash to swallow him up, up to the point of the brisk meal. Sipora recognizes from this what has to be done. She does the brisk meal herself by picking up a tzur, right? A flintstone or some kind of, you know, probably an expert in those days. They didn't have nice, like, you know, like that today. So whatever, she does the brisk meal, throws it down and says, you know, you're, you know, my, you know, you know, chasen bedamim, you know, my, my, uh, you know, my, my husband in, or, you know, in, in or, you know, my chatan in, you know, in, in blood because of the whole episode, basically. And Moshe almost died. He's on the way down to Mitzrayim, handpicked by Kodesh Borchu to save the Jewish people, and he almost dies along the way. And why does he die along the way, almost? He's because almost killed along, hmm? like he's almost killed along the way by God who's sending the Jewish Yeah, people. because this whole thing. And on top of that, on top of all that, What's the halacha if a father does not perform bris mila on, and, it, and it wasn't even a mitzvah, like the Torah hasn't been given yet? It's not, it's not on the father, it's on the son. It's on the father too. It's a, it's a mitzvah's asa and the father to do bris mila on the son until they can do the son. But what's the, what's the omish? You're over, you're, over, you're over a mitzvah's asa. It's not, there's no chiv, there's not even a chiv of it's not, you know, you can, you can force, you know, cajole the father to do it. 
on the son, if the son grows up, becomes bar mitzvah, and doesn't do bris on himself at some point, then he's chai, of course, in the end. But the father is certainly not chai misa. So what's this Rechiv Misa on Moshe Rabbeinu? Tzipora, in this episode, right, is actually written Tzadi Pei Reish Hei. The Vav is missing. So if you look at the word, the letters, it's Sur, which he took, and the rest is Peh, right, mouth. Right? The Roth, in the sense of freed the mouth, who's Moshe Rabbeinu. He's going down to Mitzrayim to face who? Who's the main antagonist? Paro. Paro, which is Peh Ra'a, the evil mouth. Right? The Gemara says that it, the Parah made them work a, a voda parach, right? That it were very hard slavery. The Gemara Darshan says, well, you know, it's perach, the soft mouth, right? What does it mean, you know, perach? He conned them, right? The measure says he conned them. In the beginning, they first, when they first, you know, Parah sent out the word that everybody should come out and help build Pitam and Ramses and all these different, you know, cities, whatever. And, uh, you know, to be a loyal Egyptian, that's what you have to do. We Jews like to be loyal citizens wherever we are. We have to come out in full, you know, full, you know, the whole, you know, Jewish people as much as possible, put as much labor as we can. We no problem, because Egyptians were working side by side with us. We're all getting paychecks, working side by side. We're good Egyptians over here, just whatever. Then at one point in time, the Egyptians stopped coming, says the Madrash, but the paychecks are still there. Okay, so they're losing out. We're doing it. They're not, you know, yeah, it's a little bit curious why they're not here, but, you know, they're lazy, whatever. We're still getting paid. And one, later on, then Paro stops the paychecks. And they go, well, okay, that's, you know, enough is enough already. This is like too much. At that point in time, they're already taskmasters that, 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 you know, prevent them from going home anymore at this point in time. The slave, the Shibut actually began. That was a perach man, a soft mouth. It was, he conned them into this avoda. The another major that says, no, perach, you know, a deeper perach is, Paro made them work so hard specifically that they could not speak the great Torah. They should come home at the end of the day and be so, in such a sense of yeush and be broken that they would not speak the great Torah. They would not get involved in meaningful discussions. Why? Because the moment that it would renew their spirits, it would keep, it would keep them basically rebellious against Paro. Paro is trying to break the spirit, like we spoke about before. That, you know, what's Paro doing? You know, you know, after Moshe comes down and says, let my people go. So Paro says, okay, now, for, just because they're, they're distracted and this whole thing, let's make the avoda even more difficult. Let's make the same demand. We won't increase the demand, but we won't give them the kash. No straw. You have to go find the kash anywhere you can in Mitzrayim and make the same quota. If you're interested in building up Pitam and Ramses and all these different cities in you know, Mitzrayim through slave labor, the last thing you do is take away the materials they need to do it. Because you're only you're working against yourself now. Because what are they going to do? They, physically, it's not possible. You can beat them all you want. You can kill them all you want. But the bottom line is, is that it's not going to work for you. Not, you know, so obviously, the point was not building up anything, but more like tearing down the ruts of B'nai Yisrael to try to break them. And what was the, what was the main breaking? Right? The main breaking was they should not use their mouths for divrei Torah. They shouldn't speak divrei Torah. They shouldn't remain connected to anything meaningful going down from Abraham Yitzchak and Yaakov. That's why not changing the language is what's so important again. It's one of the schuyot to go to leave Mitzrayim. So that's why Moshe is so concerned. Moshe is saying, if I was only going down to free B'nai Yisrael, what difference does it make if I have a stutter, don't have a stutter, I can't speak properly, I can't speak properly, big deal. You know, you got, you know, it could take me half an hour to get the words out, but eventually power is going to hear, let my people go. He's going to hear it eventually. You know, and that's the point. Because the point is not just freeing the Jewish people. That's not what it's all about. It's about freeing the Jewish mouth. That should be the meshuba. We'll see what that means in, you know, in a second, right? But if that's what it's about, then how can how can I go down with my if I'm always for sign if my mouth itself is is meshuba, right? Is, is enslaved so to speak. I can't control it the way I'm supposed to control it. So how am I the representative to go down there to free the Jewish people from power? Who's the para in the end? So that's also why you see, like when Moshe is complaining. He's afraid of Paro, so Kosh Bochum makes the stick turn into a, into a snake. Because as, as the lesson points out, the snake represented Paro. The original because the snake means a horror. Paro, all, all one of the same thing. And, and, and Rashi brings down, why duck to that? Because the, the snake, what was the main chet of the snake? Was he spoke Russian horror. Back in, back in the Gadaden. And Moshe is now speaking Russian horror about, about the Jewish people, specifically Dustin Devirim, but about the Jewish people in general. And as a result of that, you know, it's, it stares the whole geula. Story of the end. But at least we understand now why bris mila is such a major thing. Because for Moshe Rabbeinu, the average father who doesn't perform bris mila on his son, fine. You know, he's he done something he shouldn't have done, or he, sh he didn't do something he should have done at the end, right? But that's the way. That's where it ends. But since Moshe, the whole point of Moshe is bris mila, 
He exists specifically for the sake of free of the, the covenant of the word, right? So therefore, for him to even miss a moment, his own personal tafki is undone. He's not he's not just like the father doing bris on his son. He is the the, the, the Moshia, the redeemer of the Jewish people, is going down specifically to Makayim, the concept of bris to fulfill this pasuk that says, Right? That's what it's talking about. Talking about, you know, open your mouth, free your mouth, and I will fill it. What will I fill it with in the end? What am I going to fill it with? So you're shy the Pasuk, right? The Dibur Shem. So, what does this mean? Right, what does this mean? So, in other words, <clears throat> just for a second, so in other words, if I understand you correctly, in other words, the, the uh, Moshe Rabbeinu then, uh, was, uh, what Paro was doing, was doing everything possible to distract the Jewish nation and ultimately uh, through this uh, this this hard labor he was able to get them to assimilate to the point where they dropped to the 49th level of Platon, right? So he was really pushing them and pushing them to the envelope. Uh-huh. Push them out, push them out, uh-huh. yeah. And, and so they, they, they and so essentially uh, where did Miriam come into this now? Where did, where did Miriam come into this? So Miriam was unaffected. That's the thing. Miriam remained, you know, she was, she was, she was loyal. She was a, first of all, she was in a, a, a via, you know, but that's what the good Gemara points out. But she somehow miraculously was unaffected. Art also was unaffected by. It. Don't forget the Levium also were puckered from the voted the entire time through. But how did that? In other words, she got her father now to recognize that they had they had gotten to the point where they were so distracted that they weren't even having relation. They purely they divorced. Was, which was, was, yeah. which was, was the most important mitzvah, which was given. You know, even before Bris Mila, correct? Mm-hmm. So now she incited Amnon to to her her, her well, father, courage. Her, her, incited, but encouraged. Her, yeah. Encouraged, yeah. but encouraged, yeah. encouraged her father to to now take read. back his wife and everything. Right. So, right. So how did that now fit into the the antidote to distract? So we'll see. But it's no coincidence. It's, that's why it says it says a Ben Levi and Bus Levi. Yeah. Who's Levi in the Chumash? Right. What, how does Levi get his name? What, what, where does the, the word Levi come from? Yeah, yeah, so, uh, from Leviah, right? right? That and now because of this this child, this child will act as the as the connecting piece between me and, and my my husband. That's what Levi does. So but the Levi themselves act as the connecting, the source of Kohani, right? So they act as the conduit between between the Kishboruch and the Jewish people. We'll see, it's a very important part of the picture. There's a very, we'll see, you know, like Moshe Rabbeinu gets to the the fiftieth level of of. The, the Nun Sharibina just before he died, but he's born with the 49 already. The Halavai, which you can get to, you know, a few of them. But he comes in this world already with 49 levels of the Nun Sharibina, as the Gemara says. He exists for a specific reason. He has a spe- specific, you know, reality that's going to, it's going to make, it, make him the leader par excellence all through the Midbar, and, and the reason why the Jewish people can get out of, out of Mitzrayim and change and reverse the whole thing. He's not totally successful. He loses four fifths of the Jewish population in Mitzrayim in Makas Choshev. Right? And, and the one that comes out, you know, Sarbonim, the entire time they're, they're causing all kinds of problems, but nevertheless, the Gula does take place through him and will eventually take place through him when he comes back, you know, to the Gilgul, whatever, you know, Mashiach will be in the history. But uh, Levi is, is the key. That's also by Harsinai, by the by the Egla Zahav, Mila Shemilai, well, they, is right, Levi. So I, I hear what you're saying. They were really not the ones that were affected by the Avodah Yeah, because they, 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 were, they were, maintain their connection to Hashem the entire way through. Uh-huh. If you attach yourself to Levi, then you will be connected to Hashem. That's that's their that's their role. That's the role of the Kohen. You know, the Kohen, you They know. couldn't have a hashpa on the rest of the people in order to because they were very they were very they, were, they, they lived very cut off lives in a sense. They were very off to the side, and the rest of the people got very assimilated. But let's take a look. Look, 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 take a look for a second. Not here. I know what you said. It's nothing like it's like the same thing today. You know, that you have people who are. Who maintain the Masora and then other people who uh, don't have no connection to them, and, and, no and they have no. As a result, they don't. They don't benefit from the connection they have. Uh-huh. The Gemara in Chulin and Kuf Lamed Tes Amud Beis asks the question: Mordechai Minatora Menayim. We have to ask that question because Megillus Esther is written after the Torah is closed, and we hold the entire thing. You know, basically, is Ruch Hakodesh, and, and the story is obviously Ashkacha Prati. So there must be some kind of remnant. The Torah is the blueprint for Maisa Bereishi. So therefore, by definition, if it happens historically, 
especially a geula, a significant geula, somehow there must be a remnant to the characters and the plot that, t- that took place. <coughs> and it finds a passage, my drawer in, you know, in, in Pasha Kisisa. And then it asks the question, Esther, in the Tormanayan, right? And it finds, you know, Esther, Esther, Panim, in Pasha's Vyelech, right? And, uh, and then it says, how many Tormanayan? How many eights? You know, do we need to do with Right, so that, that's the shortest of Amalek when, when Adam ate this is a Tavara, so it brings him to the Haman. And then, that, which, is, which is perfectly fine, that's great, and fantastic. It's like a mattress. You figured out a way to, to find an illusion, a remez, to these three people in the Megillah, in the Torah itself. And then the Gemara throws us for a loop. The Gemara says, Moshe, in the Torah, Menayin. And at that point in time, we should all be going, What? What do you need a remez to Moshe? It's called Torah's Moshe. Moshe is everywhere. You don't need a remez. He's written up. You know, Moshe this, you know, Hashem, Moshe of the morning. It's like Moshe's all over the place, the entire Torah. You know, the Remus. It was even more mysterious, more, you know, see, you know out, of, out of place seemingly, is the, is the Gemara's answer. It doesn't say what we ask, right? It doesn't say, well, you know, you know Remus, but Moshe's written everywhere. It comes back and it says, Beshagam Hubasa, the word Beshagam. And we're all going, what's Beshagam? Right? So Rashi says, well, if you add up the letters, Beshagam, you don't, you don't have to say Beshagam, you can say Beshagam Hubasa, it's not. Beshagam is already the base of the little superfluous. Changes the gematria by two, right? And because it changes the gematria by two, turns out the shagam is equal to motion gematria. So the priest Hadik says, he says, this can't be the same question that we're asking about the other ones. Right? The other ones were clearly looking for a mazim, and here to go to our way for the gematria, and so what? So motion, you know, the gematria for shagam is equal to motion back in the end of Parshat Bereshdis, and, you know, and therefore, because, like, you know, so what did what it solve over here? So, so way too fast for yeah. Just simple. The Gemara says, "Where is Moshe alluded to in the Torah?" Right. And the Gemara answers by saying, "B'shegam, b'shegam, which means he's also because yeah, Baruch in, in the Parshas Bereshis, right at the end, the last paragraph there, yeah. where Kish Baruch is saying, I'm, I've, I've had it with these people. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to bring a, a, a flood. B'shegam hu basra. He's also flesh and blood. I can I can do this. I can do. I can. They're not malachim. You know, they're not godly beings. I, I can. I can. They're only flesh and blood. And they're vulnerable. I'm going to wipe them away. So, so Rashi points out that the you know the Gemara doesn't explain why that works. You know, to figure it out for yourself. But Rashi brings down b'shegam is the gematria of Moshe. B'shegam. B'shegam equals Moshe. Is the Gemara that you're talking about? Ben Chulin. One thirty nine B. Gotcha. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. So the priest Sadiq says the question had to have changed somewhat when we got to Moshe Rabbeinu. What's the question? Not where is a remnant to Moshe in the Torah, but more where is a remnant to the fact that Noah could have been Moshe Rabbeinu in his time? Obviously, it's a lot to read into the Gemara, you know, but the priest Sadiq, you know, Rabbi Sadiq Cohen, you can rely upon him for things like this, especially when you see the, the shot that he gives over. It makes, it makes perfect sense. So what's the story? He says because every ten generations, at least back in those times, was it was a shas, it was a potential shas geula. Ten is a, a number of, of perfection. Ten spheres, you know, is a time of you know for things to you know, you know, it's a significant you know turning point, whatever. But it was a time that the Torah could have been given. Noah could have been Moshe Benu in his time, and he says that's the reason why the rain fell from Shemaim. For 40 days and 40 nights, water is always you know, a symbol of Torah, right? Fell for 40 days and 40 nights. How long was Moshe and Harsinah receiving Torah? 40 days and 40 nights. What a coincidence, right? And he says, furthermore, that's why Hashem could easily have simply brought, brought the flood with the 40 days and 40 nights. You know, it wasn't like the Kresh Boro said, well, gee, we don't have so much rain in Shemayim. Hmm, how can we you know, finish this job in time? Let's, uh, well, have the, well, there's water on earth too. Well, those waters surge from below for 150 days, you know, and that will bring together. A tremendous flood on, on my separations. It didn't have to be that way. Forty days and forty nights could have supplied enough rain to wash out everybody. Why did Krishna Baruch add the hundred fifty days of water surging from the bottom? He says because that symbolizes Torah Shabbat the, the water coming from Shemayim, right? That's Torah Shabbat which is straight from Shemayim, right? Mipig Vura, Lamosh Rabbeinu, letter by letter, word for word. You can't change that. You can't edit that. That's Mrs. Baruchus, Koveya, that's Torsh Mitzav. Whatever it is, that's what it is. No more and no less. Torsh Balpeh works differently, right? It's based upon Torah Mitzav, as the Gemara points at all the different Ramazim, right? All the principles of Torsh Balpeh are all in Torah Mitzav. They are immutable. You can't change them, but Torah is, is Kavua. But, except for one difference, and that is that, you know, you can't light fire on Shabbat, but what about a light bulb? 
right? What about you know electric doors? What about an elevator on Shabbos? And it works. You know, what about if you change the way it works? The, the principles. Torah Shaval Peh is basically the, the evolving application of Torah itself. In every generation, right, you have to find a way to answer all the questions that come up, all the shows that come up. Could be because Moshe said to Moshe Benu, when they asked about a light bulb on Shabbos, Tamat Sasser, and Moshe might have said, what's a light bulb? Don't worry about it. One day they'll figure it out, you know, or maybe he knew what a light bulb was, but nobody else would know, but it, we don't have any writings, we don't have any recordings to show that Moshe dealt with light bulbs back in this time. Maybe he, you know, he knew about it, but you know, that was a later application that came, you know, much after, what's his name, you know, Watt, what's his name? Uh, Watt. Watt, yeah. Tommy Watt. The guy who... Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. <laughs> right. Tommy Watt, right? Yeah. What, watch this. <laughs> you know, you know, but that, you know, Thomas Edison, right? Until they had the light bulb. I suppose our engineer didn't answer that one for you. Yeah, yeah, that is too silly a question. <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, but that you know, until it came around, so all these applications. So, so tar, there's, a, there's an aspect of Torah that has always evolved. The Gemara, you know, is, is dealing all the time with you know piske halacha based upon principles that we take from the Torah itself, which are again don't change. We find how these principles apply to a situation today. So it's always evolving, and it comes out through the poskim, comes out to the tanoim, the the, the, the tanoim before the tanoim, the zugos, you know, going back to Moshe uh, Har Sinai. After that, the, you know, the Tanaim, the the Amoraim, uh, Rishon, the Gironim, Rishon, the Akronim, all the way until today, right? We contribute to that. So, what is that? That's obviously the most controversial part of Torah itself, and that part is basically, you know, is what separates the you know the Orthodox from the rest of the, Jew, the you know, you know, religious parts of Klal Yisrael is Torah Shabbat Peh. Because from our from our perspective, right, from our tradition. It is a tradition that has not changed, you know, through the you know through the years. Maybe some parts have got lost, and some parts, you know, we had to, you know, are still suffering. There's machlokas and like that. But we, we we know we know, whatever we know to be, you know, in Masar, we know that. And the rest, basically, we for the most part, to be careful, we, we go machmir a lot of times to make sure we cover all all points of view, all all you know all opinions, except in situations of crisis where we can perhaps rely upon more medical opinions. But we're always working with a certain known factor that's part of the tradition in the end. Everybody else would basically say, well, Torah Shabbat Peh is what the rabbis came along and simply made up and added to, you know, you know the Torah itself may have been divinely inspired or something like that, but Torah Shabbat Peh, they hold, is a rabbinical thing. That's the way they hold it. Because it comes through our mouths, it comes through our pens. We write, the, we write these things down. They're teachings of Chazal, right? There's Madrashim, it's part of Torah Shabbat Peh. What is actually going on in Torah Shabbat Peh? Could you just back up for one second? Yeah. Sorry, you, you, you said that the... the uh, uh, Forty days, rain came from heaven. Right, that's symbolic of Torah Shabbat. Exactly. You said the water coming from below. Yeah, I did, I did, I'm, I'm getting that point right now. I didn't finish that point. Oh, okay, right. You didn't get that point because I didn't finish so that fast, point. I can't think as fast as you talk. You we know? only have one night. Okay. <laughs> okay. The uh, so so the preacher explains because basically what is Torah Shabbat Peh? Yeah. It's also Dibur Hashem. It's also Dibur Hashem. Mm-hmm. The difference is, though, is that the, the Dibur Hashem of Tarsh Mitzav was a Kosh Baruch Hu dictating letter by letter, word by word, actually the beginning was just letter by letter, but to Moshe Ben, and he wrote it down exactly as he heard it. No, you know, he could ask questions, he could, you know, say, what does that mean, and where's that going, but, but he, did, he didn't have any, you know, authorship, other than the fact that he was recording it, you know, as a good, as a good, uh, what do you call it, stenographer, you know, you know, writing it down, you know. But Torah Shabbat is Dibur Hashem, but it's, it comes as opposed from the outside to us, the inside. It comes from the inside to the outside. Now there was the same light that Hashem used to give over Torah Shabbat instead comes through our neshama. It actually works its way down from the top, but we don't deal with the top levels of the, of the soul, which are Chayim Yechida. But it comes down basically through the neshama, through the Ruch, right? Eventually down the level of Nafesh, actually goes as far as the Ruch. And comes out in the form of words. That's the way Torah Shabbat works. He says, Nefesh Ruch Neshama, each level has its own levels of Nun Shari Bina. Because the Nun Shari Bina in Kabbalah, that's the way the light's trans, you know, transformed. It actually comes from, it's called the 32, you know, Lamed, Lamed Beis Nesiv is Chachma. The 32, the, the 32 paths of Chachma, which correspond to the 32 times that Elohim is recorded in Parshas Bereshis. Correspond to Lev also as well. That's the, the light starts to make its way down. It gets the level of being in the spheres, where it now becomes filtered. And how does it get filtered? To what's called what's, what's called the Nun Shari Bina. So Gemara says, you know, in Rosh Hashanah, 
that when Hashem made the world, He made the world with Nun Shari Bina, and Moshe got 49, right? Because the light that made my Sibarashis had to first be filtered through the level of Bina, which has 50 gates. 50, you know, whatever, you know, every gate basically is another form of filtering the light. So eventually, through those 50 gates, the light is now you know, spread out enough that you can have all of this. All that you see, the entire Mycebrations for thousands of years, the universe to the farthest reaches of the universe, basically, the stars, the planet, everything in Mycebrations, physically, spiritually, came about as a result of the fact that the light was filtered through this Nunshari Bina. Okay, it's a more covetous discussion for another time, but that's what it says. So he says, since each level, there are three levels with Nunshari Bina, that's, that's three times 50, is equal to 150, the amount of days the water surged from below. What are, the three, three, what are the three levels of being? Nefesh, no, there's Nefesh, Ruch, Neshama. Uh -huh. Each have ten spheres, right? right? So each have its own Nun Shari Bina. Uh -huh. So therefore you have three levels, uh -huh. each with Nun Shari Bina. So therefore it's going through each, 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 each Nun Shari Bina of each level. Your three times fifty is one fifty, uh -huh. corresponding to the amount of days that the water surged from below. Symbolizing that if, Moshe, if, if Noah had been able... And just to add a little twist to this whole thing, even though Moach, uh, Mo, Moshe, Moshe stands for Moach, Shes, and, and Hevel, because that's the, the path of the Gilgal was brought down, but actually there was a piece of, no, of Noach and Moshe too to be fixed up because Noach didn't do the job. And that's why when it says, Im, 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 Metzati, Chebe, Necha, in Pasha Kisisa, Kush Baruch, you know, Moshe is saying to Kush Baruch, well, after he finally got forgiveness for the golden calf, if I have found Chay in your eyes, right? So then reveal to me, you know, you know, your you know, your covet and, and understand. So the reason that points out the word chen, of course, is the reverse of Noach. Noach matzah chen ben Hashem, right? It's a reverse image, basically. So that was the aspect of Noach and Moshe Beinu. Just a side point. Makes me things more, more confusing, but but that's you know, it's, it's all built into the idea. So therefore, as a result of that, that Noach, and this is what the Gemara is alluding to, that Noach could have been Moshe in his time. Actually, Moshe Beinu doesn't make a difference. The neshama is a neshama. He came from Hevel, so Noach, you know, he had a piece of that. If Noah had, and that's why Noah takes 120 years, how long, is, how, did, how long does Moshe live for? 120 years. He's the first one to die at the age of 120. Noah took 120 years, not just to give them his chance to the Shuvah, because that's really what it was all about. Noah was there to try to carve the generation. He was supposed to bring Torah down for the world in his time. He failed. And as we have a, a con the concept is that a Kosh Baruch Hu puts a koyach of tov in the world to accomplish something historically, we spoke about this before, if we don't use the koich, it doesn't go back to Shammai. It gets used for something else instead. And very often the, the opposite. So there's a, instead of the Kabbalah Satora taking place in Noah's time, instead you have the flood, the mavu. You have water, which is Torah, coming down from, from above, and then the water from below, surging from below, basically. That was what Torah was, it was supposed to be instead of been, it was supposed to instead have, it was supposed to have been instead the Torah Torch itself and Torah Shbal Peh. It didn't work out that way. Instead we got the flood. But the point is, is what the, that's, just, you know, that's the story, but the point that the, the Prisadik is bringing out is how basically Torsh Peh works. Torsh Peh works because basically a person has become a conduit for the light of Hashem. That's the goal. We have this mitzvah of, of Bir Chumas, right? Every other time of the, you know, every other Isser, you know. Can you have Treif in the house? Yeah. Right? Is it actually to have Treif in your, if you're cleaning when he shows up, you know, she's a Filipino, something like that. She comes to your house and she brings with her a piece of meat that's not kosher. She wants to leave it in your fridge for the day, right? Is that mutter? Is that asr? Can you cook tray? Can you work in a, is a shy, you know, you know relevant shy? Can you cook in a, let's say, a, a nursing home someplace uh, where you're actually cooking tray meat for the people, not Jewish, not Jewish uh, people there. It's all, it's all Gentile, right? For them, it's perfectly per permissible, but you're a from Jew. Can you cook that meat for them? The answer, of course, is yes. Because there's no issue to cook the tray of meat. Basi is a little bit different, but it also starts off heter, you know, heter anyhow. Special, it's a chok, it's a different type of a visser. But for the most part, when it comes to this story, you don't have, an, you know, not only that, by the way, but what happens if, you, if, if uh, even by Basi Bechalav, if one sixtieth, you know, of milk falls into a chillin pot, it disperses, you can't find it anymore, you didn't do it purposely, right? What's the halacha? Bato Bashishi, right? If you have at least 60 parts to the one part, basically, that the milk is, not, even though chemically speaking, you start to open it up and you Examine a microscope, you find little you know, molecules of milk, doesn't make a difference. It goes up to the tom, and the tom is not there, so therefore it becomes permissible. Same thing by treif, right? And, and by treif, even more so, you could actually have treif, you can find a heter to cancel out, you know, there's different halachas, but the, but even the mashu is still mutter. It's not a problem. 
you have as long as the proper proportions. Only by chumas is there a mitzvah dafka to give us every last drop, even a mushroom, right? You can mevatel or sell it, what the case would be. Why specifically is that the case? Yeah, yeah, for a similar reason. We'll see why, but but this I will see what, but for some reason, right? This is the reason why, because the whole point, the whole point of 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 being an oil of goy, because Baruch Hu takes us of the first mitzvah he gives the Jewish people, right? We're in Mitzrayim still, as Rashi points out, the Torah could be given in Parshas Bo, but the first mitzvah Hashem gave to Bnei Israel. What's the first mitzvah he gives to us? Kiddush Hakadosh, right? To sanctify the new moon, could you even do the mitzvah Mitzrayim? We do the mitzvah even in the midbar. No. no. They get into Israel, conquer the land, whatever, divide the land, establish the Sanhedrin. If the Sanhedrin can do the mitzvah of Kiddush HaKadosh, why would that be the first mitzvah given to Kwa Yisrael? The Rambam says that without one Jew in Eretz Israel, can't do it. The Jewish people don't exist. Yeah. So the question is why is that the first, why is that the first mitzvah? Observing times. Hmm? Observing times. Observing time, yeah, okay, but there's a mitzvah that too. That's 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 crucial. That's a part of who we are, basically. But why would it, it, it's it's Yadua. But Kush Baruch Hu gave every mitzvah to Klai Yisrael at a specific time because of where they were holding and where they had to go. Every mitzvah was somehow attached. That's why by Mara, or they had the whole episode with Mara with the, with the water, right? You know, and as a result of that, they got Shabbos. Didn't you know? Like, went stumble, you know, all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, with these mitzvahs came up. No, because whatever was learned over here. Paved the way for these specific mitzvahs. So, of course, Rosh Baruch Hu gave the mitzvah of Kedusha Chodesh to Klai Yisrael on the way to Mitzrayim, which is why Rosh Chodesh is mentioned in the Haggadah as well. You might have, you might have thought it should start from there. Why? Why would I think that way? Why do I think the story should start with 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 with, the, with the, by, by Rosh Chodesh Nisan because all mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh Nisan began with that mitzvah? That time? You know why? What's the connection? Because Rosh Baruch Hu says to the Jewish people, okay, I'm about to take you to Mitzrayim. I have stepped into history. I don't like doing this. I'm always running the show, but always from behind the scenes. I don't like doing miracles because the whole the the the, the, the for which my separations was, was created is Bechir. Bechir by definition requires Hester Party. The moment that Kodesh Baruch Hu steps into history and he makes it that it's obvious that he's doing things, it's a nays. What's a nays? The word nays means a banner. So it announces Hashem is running the show. Hashem does not want it to work because it takes away the whole Sibah. For my separations, he wants to do things in a way that you can choose using your intellect. That's what the Sforno says. Why is why is man made but some Elohim and not but some Shekai or some other name? Because Elohim, the name, the word Elohim itself can be used for a shofar because the Sforno explains that Elohim is any intellectual being that uses its intellect for the sake of distinguishing between one thing and another thing. This is what Kosh Baruch did to make my separations, and that's why we mimic a Kosh Baruch we use our brain or intellect to figure out truth and what has to be done. Torah guides us, but you have to use your mind all the time, which is why it's used by Shoftim as well. That's what it's all about. So, so Kosh Baruch Hu does not want to have to step into history in any overt way if he doesn't have to, but he's doing it now, because we were in Seicha. As we said before, the Jewish people did not choose Geula. It was only because of Bers Avos that Kosh Baruch Hu stopped the process of assimilation before Makkah's Dam and, and reversed the process with every Makkah until finally got to Nun Shrei Kedusha, because of Bris Avas. If it was not for Bris Avas, if Kosh Baruch Hu said, bye, you guys didn't choose it? What do you want from me? I gave you a chance, you know? But Bris Avas meant somebody had to leave Mitzrayim at some point in time. This is the last generation. After you guys, there's no one left anymore. You could be assimilated. So Kosh Baruch Hu stepped in on behalf of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov to save Klai Yisrael. So therefore, Kosh Baruch Hu is not going to squander the opportunity, so to speak. He says, for me to go ahead and step into history in such an obvious, overt way that even Paro is being forced to understand who Hashem is, not Elohim, because Elohim works by Derek Teva, even Paro knows Elohim, which is why he's, he's, using, he's going into the, into the Nile River, as Rush explains, because now that Elohim works, meaning you know, but in a, through, through Teva, and he always used, always used the flood, and this, you know, he knows Elohim, but Mi Hashem, he says, why should Paro have to know Mi Hashem, why, you know, you know this whole thing? Because Kosh Baruch is saying that this is going to establish the whole reason why I'm doing this and who you are as a nation. So the first mitzvah he takes is Kiddush HaChodesh. Why? Because the moon symbolizes the Jewish people. As the Gemara points out, Elikui Lavana is a bad symbol for the Jewish people. When you go outside and you do Kiddush, Kiddush Lavana, you become a Pene Shechina, 
right? The moon, the sun symbolizes the, the rest of the world because it's 365 days. The physical world is symbolized by 365 days. They are tachas Hashem, ain't ever tachas, you know, ain't right refers to the physical world as the moral points out but the there's nothing new but above the sun where Kla Yisrael lives and exists that's a whole different reality there's all kinds of chedushim at that point we can mechadish all kinds of things and actually be credited as a, as a created brachis you know, on our own in the end so Kosh Baruch Hu says he says for this to work for this to be justifiable for me doing this, you have to understand why you're going out. Why are you going out? What's unique about the moon? Well, it waxes and it wanes, it comes and it That's fine. That's also true. In Jewish history is exactly like that. We wax and we wane. It's part of extinction. We come back full forest and then almost extinction again, right? But that's not the most important point. What is unique about the moon? I don't know if you can see it tonight, but uh, here's Levana. You know, you can see this. It's incredible how bright and white this this hunk of stone is floating around. You know, in space around the Earth, I think it's the only moon that goes counterclockwise. All the rest of them go clockwise. This one goes kind of counterclockwise in the end. Our moon, but it is bright. It is white. You can actually see with it in, a, in an area where there's no there's no light. You know, and it's a it's a full moon. There's no clouds. You can actually see the ground. You can distinguish rocks and all kinds of things. It's incredible. And it's only a rock. And you look at it and you're saying, where is it? You know, if you didn't know better as a child. You'd assume it's some kind of like, you know, it's like the sun a bit. Okay, not as bright as the sun, because you can look at it, but it's got some kind of like, you know, you know it's an aspect of light built. That's what you would assume. No, no, that's a rock. Now, Abba, where is it getting its light from? From the sun. You haven't seen the sun. Well, it's over there. It's behind the earth, right? The moon can see the sun because it's further out there. You can't see because you're on this part of the planet. It's around, uh, but the moon can see the sun. And the, the moon receiving its light from the sun. You know, all that light is just a reflection of the sun's light. That's exactly what it is. So Kosh Baruch says to Moshe Benu, you're not just an Or Goyim, right? Don't think that you're, like, I'm taking you to, be, to become an Or Goyim. It's not in the, the classical understanding of Or Goyim. Like, for example, Einstein with E equals MC squared. Is that Or Goyim? Um, some level, maybe perhaps not what the Torah means. You know, Karl Marx, you know? <laughs> every, every, every turning point, every change of philosophy and history Somehow there's a Jew involved somewhere in the process, right? Is that what the Torah is talking about? No. No. So then what are we talking about? More accurately, the Jewish people are reflectors to the Goyim. Not just or the Goyim, reflectors to the Goyim. The whole point of Klai Israel is to reflect the light of Hashem, who's like the sun, to the world. And if, if you have a lunar eclipse, right, for example, at nighttime, right, where it gets, gets covered up for whatever reason, now the earth blocks the light in such a way, it's dark. Is there any other source of light? Well, the stars are there, but they're not so bright. You can't tell much from the stars, right? If the moon's not giving up its light at nighttime, there's nothing else to do it. If the Jewish people are not going to reflect the light of Hashem to the world, no one else is going to do it. The world will revert back to Tov Bohu, as the Gemara says in Shabbos, Yom HaShishi, the Hei is the Chamishi Chum Torah. Shishi refers to the sixth day of Siva. The world was commanded if the Jewish people accept Torah 2,448 on, on the sixth day of Siva, Right, the well and you know is good and fun. The whole thing is you know you can refuse to go on, but if not, the world goes back to Tov Okay, that's you know to sum it up, right? In a, in a in a general sense, a big picture sense. Isn't, yeah. isn't, it, isn't it very it, it, when you think about it uh, that when you see the moon and the sun, it's a rock, like you say, it's a rock. I mean, it's not a mirror; it's only a rock. Right. I mean, so a rock will absorb the light. Correct. So, how is it reflected? Well, it's round enough, I guess. It's flat enough to be able to reflect the light. How much does it reflect? I mean, it's just a, a real black body. It is reflects. Yeah. The only difference is that, is that if, if, it's, if it's jagged, it depends how much. Yeah. If it's jagged, so it's reflected different angles. Uh -huh. You know, so there's not enough light collecting together necessarily to, to receive that reflection. Some like we're far enough away, the moon is round. Enough, whatever, but enough enough light gets reflected to us in the end that we can see it's like a white light. It's, it's not even gray, but it's like white. So essentially, so you're, so you're saying that we are like, if I understand, we are like the moon principally because that we we ha, we are the conduit by which we bring in the light of Hakadosh Baruch Hu into the world. Exactly. And without us being that mediator or that arbitrator or that medium, 
then the world would be destroyed. Exactly. Go to Tova Vohu. Go back to Tova Vohu. Which Boku steps in at some point, corrects things, but usually at great cost. So that's times. why the flood came. Right. Because Noah was not exactly. a medium. He yeah. was not a medium. Exactly. He was not a moon. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. So based upon that, you know, if you have a pipe, for example, you let's say you put a. You know, so in other words, the mi- uh, just wait. So the, in other words, it's not a coincidence that the mitzvah of Kiddush Hakodesh would have been brought when Moshe arrives. Right. That's dafka. That's dafka. That's, that's setting up. It, that, uh-huh. It's the fact that it's taking place at Yitzchak Mitzrayim uh-huh. is saying this is the reason for Yitzchak Mitzrayim. This is the basis. Uh-huh. Of, if you if you if you don't fulfill this concept. In a sense, you reverse the whole concept of, of Yitzhi Mitzrayim in the end. But he was the medium that brought this. Yeah, because he's functioning, Levi functions in that capacity automatically. That's why the whole story revolves around a Ben Levi, a Bas Levi, you know, Miriam, and all that, because that's what Levi does. Levi is the example of this idea, of this idea of acting as a conduit. And that's what Moshe's struggle is too. Moshe's whole struggle in the beginning, though, he gets Ari to come to act as his, you know, because the other shot as to why. You know, what oral society means, and Moshe was concerned with, because Moshe was basically living at an extremely high level. Mm-hmm. And he was saying, how can I go, this is actually a very, it's actually a beautiful idea, because it ties the whole concept of, of, of the moon's complaint in the first place, of Api Kabbalah, when the moon says, how can two crowns wear the, you know, how can two kings wear the same crown? Kabbalah explains, he's not talking about jealousy over here. The moon corresponds to the Malchus of its seals, which corresponds to Shechina, is on the level in the spheres where evil can't get to it. If I have to project my light into that world, this is all from the result, right? Into that world, then, then the, 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 the Kachas of Tuma can get to that light and abuse it. That's what I'm worried about, says, says you know, the Shkina. So Moshe Rabbeinu has a similar time. When he says, I'm also a sign. Basically, that I, how can I translate, you know, it's like, it's like taking a gadol door, you know, and asking him to go meet some, some bocher, let's say somebody potential, might be, you know, from one day in a bar, right? And try to get, convince him to leave that bar and go to Yeshiva. It's like, you know, it's like, Hechi Timson, the entire thing is like, you have to go in a place like that in the first place, and to talk to him is that type of environment. It's like, you know, it's like, it's not going to happen. It's, like, it's not real. So Moshe says, how can I go down to, to Paro's palace? And the, 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 this is the source of tomb in the world at this stage of history. You know, and talk to this Pev Ra'ab, his evil mouth, and translate the words of Hashem in a way that he can relate to it and connect to it and, and, and go out? I don't want to go down that level. I don't want to go so far in the end. So Kosh Baruch Hu says, fine, I will... Aaron will be your, your Elohim. He'll be your Navi. He'll talk on your behalf. He'll be your mouthpiece. So Aaron is acting like Bina with respect to Chachma. Aaron's taking the light of Moshe Benu and he's filtering it on a level because he's on the same level as Moshe Benu is. So therefore, he's taking that light and filtering it down that Paro can connect to it. But you see that he disappears from the picture. Once they're out of the Mitzrayim and Moshe is now the one talking to Kalasra all the entire time, there's no, there's no second, you know, there's no mouthpiece anymore. It's all Moshe speaking. You never hear but Oros will sign him again after that. He speaks perfectly fine. He's the one, he's the great communicator, in fact, right? Because now he's in an environment where he can actually, you know, connect and, and maintain that level of Kedusha the entire time through. But the goal is, is this conduit. Now, if you build a pipe, you put a pipe in the wall to bring water. You go this whole process, right, of, of you, know, you know, building the pipe in, nice copper piping, you know, with the bearers and the sink and the whole thing is fantastic, Right? But as somebody, you know, I think in Harnaf used to do this, when they used to build the buildings here, the Arabs used to sabotage uh, a lot of the uh, construction by putting con- concrete in the, you know, the pipes, you know, they had to block it up, you know, and to get it later on, the building's already up, it's a, it's a big problem, right? So it's like, you know, what good is it? If you, if you can have the most fantastic, intricate system of bringing water, but there's a stima anywhere in the system, or a park of stima, you can't get the water, or you just get a little bit of water. You go, wow, that's fan- this, see this barrels over here? Cost me two hundred shekels, you know, or two hundred dollars. You know, it's like it's like a gold theater, you know, the sink is like a marble sink, it's you know, turn it on, you know, it just trickles out. Big deal. Right? So if Kla Israel is blocked, we're supposed to be a tzibar. We're supposed to be a conduit. We're supposed to open our mouth so Kush Bokhu can fill it with his word. But as we see from, from the base of Mikdash, the Kedushi cannot go to places of tumor. So if you're going to live a life on any level, According, it's not all or nothing, according to the level that you're going to live on. As much too much you allow to come into your life, that's how much you block the light of Hashem. When Hashem says, wide yourself, He says, we know that I can put my, put my, you know, I can fill your mouth with my word. He's saying, get rid of all the chumas. Even a mashahu. Right? Make yourself in a conduit, a vehicle through whom I can 
you know, filter, you know, you know, my Torah, my light into the world, and I'm attacking the entire Maisa Bereshis. That's what the Pasuk means. That's the whole point of Maisa Bereshis. That's the whole point of Yusuf Smarai. You know, time right now, if you want, I mean, I, I, I said another kind of Haggadah, right? I think, I, think, I think what you also said that the, the religious I think when, when you talk about uh, when the Leshem says that uh, that we were not on the uh, 49th level of uh, impurity, we were actually on the 49th level of Tahara. No, it's 50th level at that point. 50th level. <clears throat> right. We weren't at 50 because when we were 50, we would have lost our Bechir, I think. But, but well, we did lose our Bechir temporarily. We did, uh, uh, until it was taken away from us. The night Leil Seder, we lost all Bechir. Uh -huh. Right? Because, and that's why the four fifths were taken out in Makas Choshik, because if you hadn't chosen Geula by that time, basically, then there was no free choice to do it. Makas Bochavas, because of course, Boch himself is Mofia, his Or, you know, you know to, into my Bereshi. To such a degree, there was no denial. You couldn't, even Paro had to admit and go running to the streets looking for Moshe and say, go out, go, this is God doing it. Clearly, no one else can do this thing. Pray for me. So he says, he says, pray for me. I showed my also Bechor. Right? So there was no Bechir. And then the Kosh Baruch by Chatzot, which is why the have to come in is by Chatzot, pulled the light away. And from Sesu Kochavim, and every year is the same thing. From Sesu Kochavim until Chatzot, the light came down for free. Mm -hmm. And the Haggadah, so what's the Haggadah doing there? So the whole point of the Haggadah... You're talking about the Leil Seder, the Seis Chachavim, when the stars come out, Seis Chachavim, till Chatzos... Exactly. Every Leil Seder. That's, that's the light that. comes down, that came down on its shrine that night, where there's no Bechira, uh -huh. right? And you actually... I mean, not to, you know, it would, it, to the extent that you are cleaned up of all your Chumas, is the extent to how much you can receive the light. The Makublin may ask the question, every other time of the year, if you want to have this light come to you, you must do something to bring it about. You have to be mamshich the light, the or to you. How do you do it? By mitzvahs, by the activities, you know, Rosh Hashanah, you do simanim at the table, you daven, you yom kippur, you fast, whatever. You're doing something to bring, if you don't do these activities, the light won't come to you. Leil Seder, it comes automatically. But Leil Seder is the one that we do everything. It's like hours upon hours of activities. So if, 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 what's the point of the Haggadah if not to draw the light to you? Just to make sure you're in the right place at the right time when the light comes down. Mm -hmm. But it's more than that. It's to make sure that when the light comes down, you're a fitting conduit. And that's why it begins with Seder, right? You sing the table of contents. I mean, it's going to be late, I'm sorry, but you know, you know, we don't have enough time before, before Pesach, but Seder, you know, like, who sings the table of contents and everything? What's his emphasis on Seder for? Because, of course, Baruch Hu says, what's an Elohim? What did I do? The Rambam points out, the first time it says, V'yomer Elohim, it mentions that Shem spoke is by the creation of light. What is the point of light? To bring Seder to the world. That's what light does. Light allows you to make relationships and organ. Turn off the lights, you can't see it. It's all, it's all to Tova Vohu. So, Kosh Bochu, the Ramban says that the first act of will, so to speak, expressed in the Torah, is the creation of light. Because a Kosh Bochu Elohim is somebody who brings Seder to the world. So, Kosh Bochu says, I am taking you out of Mitzrayim to make Seder in the world. That's your whole. If you're not going to bring Seder, it goes back to Tohu. All over again, right? So that's the reason why the Seder is so crucial in the, in the actual, it's called Seder, to remind us that's the reason I took it of Mitzrayim. Kadesh. What's Kadesh? The Gemara says that, you know, that the whole idea of Havdalah is in the Bruch, in the Bruch Atachon of Adam Da'as. Why? Because Havdalah, which is, you know, Kiddush the same idea, is a function of the intellect. It's distinguishing, separating, seeing that this, this is, you know, this is, you know, one thing, and this is a different idea. The Gemara has always been mechalic, you know, in, in, in Sfaras, the ideas and the ideas, because the idea is to get to the bottom line of an idea. You cannot distinguish good from bad if you don't know the essence of a concept. You see, for example, the world connects to holiness. You know, so they, what are they, they have the holy crusades. It's an oxymoron. Oh. Totally, right? Holy crusades. We're going to go across Europe, go to Eris Israel, and kill every innocent person along the way who will not convert to Christianity. Right? It's like it's like that's called holy, you know. The concept of the word halo comes from the word holy because you know the idea of angels being holy. The world understands holiness, but they don't understand what it means. They don't understand the proper application, is because they, they, they don't they don't have the concept of tomb of a tahara. So the next mitzvah is orchats, right? Washing, right? The zman zman beis mikdash because you couldn't touch food with you know you know with, with hands and all you know you know so you know what makes sure the hands with tahara. The whole seder is geared to getting rid of the chumats. Whatever you did until that point in time, physically, right? Even take at the at Bir Chumas, you write down. Some people write down, you know, the Yitzharah. They put the fire and burn it too. 
even if you don't write it down, but there's a little feeling that says, just like this, you know, my Yitzhahar, the Chumas is just a Yitzhahar, it's, it's, it's the ego, it's all things that Chal say, Chazal say, it. but what is it primarily? It's a stima. It's all the things that personally we have within ourselves that block us from being a conduit for the light of Hashem. So by Leil Seder, you've done it physically. But Leil Seder itself, you start doing it spiritually. Everything about the Seder is geared to cleaning you out. Not just spring cleaning, the full thing, the real beer chumas in the end. Because as the, as the chumas leaves you from step to step in the Haggadah, the more the light can come and fill you. The more you become a conduit. And that's what Torah Shabbat is all about. The Gemara in Gittin, and I think also in, in Erech, in some ways, says that the whole bris was based upon Torah Shabbat Peh. The whole bris that Baruch Hu made, because that's the ultimate representation of a person's neshama, of a person's connection to the, uh, the world of Ruchnas, Ruch Mamalala, as Uncle call, calls it, right? It's the measure of how much soul is, was, there is in the person with respect to the body. That's the personality of a person. And speech defines it, reveals it. So therefore it's Pesach, the mouth that spoke. Because Baruch Hu calls it Yom, you know, you know, Chag Matzos, because we've Matzah. That's how you know we symbolize what we're doing. From our perspective, it's it's it's, it's Chag Pesach, right? Pesach, the, as the Maral points out, Pesach, the mouth that spoke. That's why the Jewish people they leave Mitzrayim, they're fleeing from the Mitzrayim, right? They're in the Midbar. Paro says Navuchim, they're conf- they're confused. Why does he say that? Because he sees them, they come right back to Yom Tov all over again. They actually went past. They were on their way. There's you know they come back. And they, they backtrack, because if they're going to leave, they have to leave the proper way. So where do they leave from? A place called Piachiras, right? The Mount of Freedom, because that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Pesach is a time of year you free your mouth. You where free is, your mouth. You, you free your mouth. You free the Jew. That's the, where a Jew's mouth is. That is where he is with respect to Chiras. And the whole Haggadah is built, such, set up in such a way, built such a way, that they do exactly that. Moshe Beinu came to do it, but that's what we're trying to do. It's the time, Zaman Chayosenu, is the time we free the mouth. When you free the mouth, you undo the para, which is paro, you accomplish what you're here to accomplish, and you become a conduit for the life of Kishbaruch There's nothing more fulfilling than that.